and that does not come when the federal government sets its one-size-fits-all agenda on top of people. I yield to, uh, to the uh, gentleman from Texas for as much time as he may consume. Well, I thank the gentleman from uh, Utah for yielding and for hosting this night's uh, hour to talk about the, uh, the Tenth Amendment and uh, federalism. <clears throat> it's probably been read into the record 11 dozen times, uh, but I want to read a, record, uh, a, a quote from James Madison into the record that sets the tone for what I want to talk about. Uh, James Madison in Federalist 45 paper said, the powers delegated to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The former will be exercised principally on external objects such as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce, and the powers reserved to the several states will extend to all of the objects in which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concerns the lives, liberties, and properties of the people. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd argue that therein lies much of the problems that we face today as a, uh, uh, as a federal government. Since 1995, uh, this Congress and the various administrative agencies across this vast federal government have issued some 60,000 new rules and regulations uh, from everything from regulating the size of the holes in Swiss cheese to the uh, uh, colors for surgical sutures. And uh, I would argue that the size of a hole in Swiss cheese uh, probably should be defined by the folks in Wisconsin where they do a lot of cheese. but. Uh, a federal rule, federal law that uh, delves into that detail into the, as Madison would have referred to it as, the uh, ordinary course of affairs that concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, uh, that's a government that's overreached. Um, part of our problem is we send people to Congress who are at their core can-do people, solution people, folks who want to solve issues. And our focus here is on every single problem. Uh, while uh, our Constitution, though, says that we really are limited by the, uh, the powers granted of the Constitution to this government as to those problems which we ought to take up. Clearly national defense, clearly homeland security, uh, post office roads, as it is used, the phrase is used. But uh, much of what we deal with every single day here in Congress is, uh, is beyond those limited powers. And, uh, but because we are uh, solutions-oriented kind of folks, then that's our nature, is to grab the bull by the horns and move forward with it, losing sight, of course, that the Constitution says uh, that's not a real, uh, a real good sentence, I mean, a real good thing for us to be doing. Let me reemphasize that last sentence. The powers reserved to the several states, several states will extend to all the objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's an awful lot of, uh, of the area of lives that uh, committees like education and, and, uh, and workforce or labor, uh, many of the committees up here deal in the ordinary course of affairs of the lives of people. Uh, part of the rancor that we see across this country as related to the federal government is a sense of powerlessness by the good folks back home over issues that really ought to be dealt with back home. Uh, this rage that we're seeing is, an overreach, is driven by an overreaching federal uh, government. Uh, decisions that are best made at the local level uh, and controlled by those people are being usurped and taken care of by the 435 people here in, in uh, Washington and the 100 senators on the other side. Uh, and, this, and much of that frustration at being out of control is as a result of this Congress taking over jobs that, uh, in, in, in areas uh, that are much better left to counties and cities and states uh, as the uh, Founding Fathers had intended. If we were to quit delving into their personal lives, affairs, uh, and ordinary course affairs, uh, much of the conflict that uh, is out there it would, would uh, disappear and would be focused on a local level where, best, where the decisions are made best as to the solution that best, fit, best fits those local folks. I get asked often, by mayors and county judges and city councilmen and county commissioners and school superintendents and others. What can we do to help? What can we do to address the growing size of this federal government? And one of the ways I ask them to help is to do a better job of vetting your requests to me and to your federal government for help. Uh, make sure that whatever it is that you're asking us to do that uh, is a good idea, that there is a nexus to the Constitution, that there is a link uh, in the Constitution that delegates the powers to this federal government to it even deal with the particular problem that you're uh, bringing to us. <clears throat> I would argue that much of our uh, overspending today is driven by good-hearted people 
who have lost sight of the Tenth Amendment have come up here and, and asked for help from this federal government, not, of course, realizing the strings that are going to be attached to the federal uh, laws that get put in place when the solution would have much better <clears throat> have been dealt with uh, at, uh, at, the, uh, at the local level. The um, uh, federalism, as, uh, as my colleague from Utah has just stated, it's not really a left or right issue. It's not really a Democratic issue or Republican issue. Uh, there, is, uh, there are good things to be had by both sides. Both sides of the aisle should be able to embrace this concept uh, so that uh, the states do most of the heavy lifting and the counties and the cities and local governments do the, the work that deals with the issues confronting their people. And so this really shouldn't be a particularly partisan uh, effort as we, uh, uh, as we move forward. My friend asked, uh, mentioned earlier about the, uh, the idea that the states uh, uh, should be the incubators uh, or the laboratories for experiments with how government addresses a particular program. Uh, two examples that I can, can uh, think of off the top of my head, one is the healthcare experiment going on in Massachusetts. Uh, they've been at it now three or four years, and it's different than what they thought it would be. It may not be replicating it. It may not be able to push that to scale to the United States. And the people of uh, Massachusetts are struggling with how to pay for health care under the universal plan that they put in place, where everybody was mandated to have uh, insurance. It doesn't look to me like it's working. Um, and so why would you then want to take that, uh, that policy and try to extend it across the United States? I don't think you would. An area where it has worked, and it's, uh, you know, I'll brag on Texas, uh, six years ago, Texas put in place a, a, a tort reform program that limited uh, the, uh, not, uh, the punitive damages on medical malpractice suits. So we've had a six or seven year experiment involving 25 million people in Texas, and it has worked. Doctors are coming to Texas because their malpractice insurance rates are lower. The, the citizens of Texas are getting the, the uh, care that they need. Uh, when a hospital or if a hospital and a physician make a mistake, the economic damages and trying to put that person back to as close to what they would have been before the mistake was made, that gets done. But these uh, 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 punitive damages, which sometimes are, you know, just define uh, logic, are no longer on the table in Texas. And so that experiment, as the president called for uh, in his health care speech to, to test medical malpractice ref, uh, reform in, around the country. I would argue that we've had a six, almost seven year test now working uh, with the state of Texas on medical malpractice reform, tort reform, uh, that really works. And so in that vein, uh, to the extent that uh, this would be needed at the federal level to, to deal with uh, the, the vast medical programs that we have in place is, uh, uh, could be replicated uh, on a much, uh, a much larger scale because we've had a, a big enough test uh, through the state that it makes sense. So let me finish off by saying that um, uh, you know, because they lived 230 plus years ago, we sometimes give our founding fathers short shift as to how intelligent they really were. We think because we are the most intelligent people walking the face of the earth that we've got all the great ideas that, uh, that uh, we don't really need to look back into history to see and understand what they had in mind. Quoting Madison again out of the Federalist Papers, the powers delegated to the federal government are few and defined. That means if you've got a, a plan that doesn't fit under one of those powers, then the federal government really, at the end of the day, should not uh, pass laws that deal with that. We should have the, the backbone to say, that's a, that's a really tough problem, it's really important to people, but it's not the federal government's responsibility to address that. You need to work within your own system back home to address that issue. That's one of the hardest things members of Congress do. We hate to tell constituents, no, that's really not something that the federal government should be dealing with, and yet that really should be the answer to many of the questions that we get, many of the requests that we get uh, from back home is that uh, these aren't uh, federal issues. Those which remain, quoting Madison again, those which remain are to, uh, those which are to remain in the states governments are numerous and indefinite. The former will be exercised principally on external ob objects such as war, peace negotiations, and foreign commerce. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the objects which, again, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would argue that all of us would learn uh, uh, a much better appreciation of how limited this federal government really should be uh, if we were to, uh, to go back and take a look at Founding Fathers' uh, comments and just uh, periodically read the Constitution. I, uh, it is a requirement on my staff 
and uh, I've introduced legislation that would, uh, would, in would uh, encourage members of Congress and their staffs to read the Constitution once a year. Uh, we all have the little pocket versions and we write it in the front cover. Uh, when, when's the last time that uh, we read the Constitution? It's not a long tome, it's 2,500 words or so. It's not like trying to wade through war and peace. Uh, you can sit down and read it and, uh, and understand exactly what your federal government should be doing and then everything else is left to the states. And I, with that, I'll yield back. I appreciate the time for my colleague from uh, Utah. I appreciate Mr. Conway from Texas for giving us once again some putting us in perspective and giving us some specific examples. Um, one more time, if, if you're 